Hi, it's Steve Harganon, and welcome to Library 2.022, Libraries and Privacy. We are so grateful to have you here. Our founding partner, the San Jose State School, University School of Information, is the founding partner for the conference. And at this time, I'm going to turn some minutes over to Dr. Sandra Hirsch and Dr. Anthony Chow. Hi, everyone. I'm Sandy Hirsch, and I am the Associate Dean for Academics in the College of Professional and Global Education at San Jose State University. And on behalf of San Jose State University School of Information, I'm very pleased to welcome you all to this Library 2.0 conference focused on libraries and privacy, critical issues for information professionals. I am very excited that today's mini conference is going to be focusing and addressing how libraries and organizations are and should be addressing the complex issues surrounding privacy in libraries, which have been increasingly complicated and become more sensitive in the digital realm. Uh, I want to especially thank our partner, Dr. Dara um, Hoffman, uh, who is an assistant professor at the STSU uh, School of Information, who has helped us put together this outstanding mini conference today. So we're very grateful for all the work that you did. We know it took a lot of effort and we're really appreciative. And uh, as I said, San Jose State University iSchool is proud to, to sponsor this important discussion. And I look forward to learning the latest developments related to privacy and libraries. So with that, I'd like to now introduce Dr. Anthony Chow, who is the director of the San Jose State University School of Information. Thank you so much, Sandy. Uh, it's good to see everybody. Uh, my name is Anthony Chow, the uh, director of the School of Information at San Jose State. Thank you for attending today's Library 2.0 conference. The SJSU iSchool is one of the largest schools of information in the nation, if not the world, and we are globally known for being high tech, high touch, and high quality. It gives us tremendous pleasure to host today's proceedings as part of our commitment to the field and society in general. I want to especially thank uh, again, Dr. Hoffman uh, and all of our distinguished uh, panelists and presenters that you will see later today. I hope you have a wonderful time, make new connections, and have meaningful and robust thoughts, learning moments, and conversations throughout. Now back to you, Dara. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anthony and Sandy, and hello, everyone. So happy to have you here with us today, and I'm delighted to introduce you to our keynote panel. It's the panel of my dreams. I couldn't have put together a better group of scholars to talk to you all today. Um, so I'm just going to go around the screen and introduce everyone. First, we have my dear friend, Dr. Kay Royal, an attorney and global privacy professional with 25 years of experience in the legal and health related fields. That's right, she's a nurse too, she does it all. Uh, Kay received her law degree from the Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law at Arizona State University and her PhD in public policy from the University of Texas at Dallas. She is currently the global privacy officer for OutSchool, an online education program, and she has the whole alphabet soup when it comes to privacy certifications. Um, and so we're delighted to have Kay with us today. Thank and you. Next we, next, we have Rebecca Sosa, who is the Regents Professor at the James E. Rogers College of Law at the University of Arizona. Professor Sosi, who is of Yaqui descent, is a faculty member for the Indigenous Peoples Law and Policy Program at the University of Arizona, and she's widely known for her work in the fields of federal Indian law and Indigenous peoples human rights. Uh, prior to joining the U of A faculty, Professor Sosi was a Regents Professor and Vice Provost for Inclusion and Community Engagement at Arizona State University. And she was the first faculty executive director for ASU's Indian Legal Program and served in that position for 15 years. Uh, she does incredibly important work on sovereignty, self-determination, cultural pluralism, environmental policy and cultural rights. And I'm so delighted to have her with us today. And last but certainly not least, we have Dr. Michael Zimmer, who is an associate professor at Marquette University. He is a privacy and data ethics scholar whose work focuses on digital privacy and surveillance, the ethics of big data, internet research ethics, and the broader social and ethical dimensions of emerging digital technologies. Uh, as I said, he's an associate professor at Marquette University in the Department of Computer Science, uh, where he serves as director of the Center for Data Ethics and Society. His research projects have focused on both quantitative and qualitative investigations into the privacy and ethical dimensions of big data and computer Computational science, social science research, and we are thrilled that you could join us today. 
So now that I've introduced you all to our wonderful panel, this is going to be a little bit different from maybe some keynotes. I thought, since we have these amazing folks with us today, that we could just have a conversation about some of the big questions out there. Um, so I will start, and feel free, y'all, to just uh, jump in uh, in whatever order you prefer. Uh, so privacy and data sovereignty seem to be hot topics these days across disciplines and in the popular press. So why do you think these issues have come to be so front of mind? And what do you see as the most pressing issues in this space? Hey, I hate dead air. So Dara, you might you might have to call on someone because we're all going to be very respectful of the other. <laughs> so I would say that uh, to address your first point, thank you for having us, uh, first of all. But to address your first question, why is it so prevalent nowadays? It's prevalent because of the massive amounts of data that are being collected, but also because of the commerce that is based on the massive amounts of data that are collected. And this is worldwide. You would think that the general consumers are more aware of it because of the breaches that happen. And I would say that was probably true six, 10 years ago, but now they're more aware of it because of the news around it and not just breaches. Uh, they're hearing about data out of uh, Europe or Japan or China or South America. And all of these are inundating them. Uh, especially cookie banners, let's put it that way. There's one of the reasons that people know about it is the infernal cookie banners that pop up. Thank I you, think, Kate. Oh, I go think, ahead, Michael. Yeah, I think I think billing from that, um, you know, many of us that have worked in this field for 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 many, many years have pointed to these concerns and and, and this type of data collection. And again, uh, I think uh, many in the in in the public uh, benefited from this and benefited from the data collection in, in ways that uh, certainly outweighed any potential threats. Uh, and it was only when you know some very public things started happening, like the Edward Snowden leaks, I think was kind of a turning point that all of a sudden people realized that oh, even my emails might be intercepted, you know, without a warrant, and suddenly. It almost became this bipartisan concern about about you know whether or not there's uh, overreaching taking place on whether it's government or corporations and their ability to sort of um, take a look at and analyze you know the the kinds of information that that we're exchanging or engaging with online. So I think there became a little bit more of a realization of the potential harms, and especially for vulnerable populations. And I think that's something that's really kind of shown the light and made this more of a, a, a larger public awareness. Thank you, Michael. Rebecca? Thank you, Dara. Um, and thanks for the great questions that you are considering for our panel today. I'm really honored to be here and, and my work has really heavily focused on the rights of Indigenous peoples to data sovereignty. And I got into that work in the context of a case which is now pretty infamous involving the Havasupai tribe and the use of the samples that they gave for a diabetes study for these unauthorized and, and unconsented purposes. And that was a 2004 case that ultimately was settled. But what was very important for me to learn as a scholar of federal Indian law at that time was that the interests of Indigenous peoples as a collective are not well represented in the ethical standards that we use. And, and I think that is still true to some extent that the collective interests of Indigenous peoples are not really used in the standards that we use to assess privacy interests or you know, what is a permissible sharing of data and under what conditions that happens. I'm actually very intrigued that you have put the three of us on the panel together. I have the utmost respect for the work um, that Kay Royal and Michael Zimmer are doing, that the vast amount of knowledge about privacy is just, I mean, I am eager to get in a conversation with them, but from my perspective, working with Indigenous peoples, it is always about overcoming epistemic forms of injustice that have really excluded Indigenous peoples from the conversation for so long. And at this moment in time, it is an international discussion, probably 
and, and here I'm going to get into something which may be a form of ideology. I don't mean to take us off track, but there's an active discussion about data colonialism and about the right of different nation states that have been subjected to histories of colonization and marginalization to actually vindicate them their own rights and, and their own forms of expression within the dominant Western frames that control information technologies today. The digital divide, a huge human rights issue, and the ability of countries to track and exercise surveillance over marginalized groups within those countries, there are staggering human rights issues. So if our time permits today, I can talk to both the international and the domestic frames for those, but, but they are vast and they um, certainly are not resolved right now. Thank you so much. And that's a wonderful kind of transition into my next question is that these digital technologies were originally imagined to be very democratizing and liberatory, but instead we've landed in this place where instead, as the saying goes, we're a product and huge networks of companies and government agencies that we'll never even hear of have intelligence files on each of us. Do you guys see a liberatory future for us with digital technologies? And if so, what role will privacy and data sovereignty play in that future? I'll jump in. That's that's a tough question. Um, I'm glad you're 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 asking it. I think I think we can all kind of trace um, a lot of what's happening in the current tech environment. You know the way that Shoshana, whose office framed this as surveillance capitalism, and that we've built economic incentives for companies to leverage the data that we're all providing freely. We get free products that are really useful, and and we get a lot of benefit from. And again, those risks and those harms were often very hidden. Um, and you know, if I'm if I'm trying to be hopeful, and if I'm trying to think of a liberatory direction that we might be going to, I, I suppose we could point to the fact that privacy is now becoming a competitive feature, and and the pressure that changes that Apple is making and how they're designing their products and designing their their software is now putting pressure on both Google in terms of their Android system, and then Facebook and other companies that leverage the data to perhaps rethink, you know, their approach to just wholesale gathering data and, and monetizing it. Um, it's unclear where that end is going to lead us to, you know, like where we're going to go and if Apple's going to be successful. And I don't necessarily think Apple is completely off the hook either, but, but you know, they're all making business decisions. Uh, but we are starting to see that kind of awareness, you know, and, and, and privacy being more of a design feature. Um, as, as opposed to as opposed to something that's fixing a flaw. So I, I think maybe we're starting to move in that kind of direction, but I'd love to hear what, what Rebecca or, or Kay think on this as well. I'm gonna to ask to go as an official matter last on every question because it really helps me to hear the broader context. It's okay, sorry to put you on the spot, but I think you're next. <laughs> Happy to. So the, the first thing I thought of, Dara, when you asked the question was privacy is a luxury for those with money. So your, your comment about if it's free, we're the product. I wish more people could understand that, that free email, free data storage, free services, free games means that the data that we're exchanging for that is what they're looking for, the product. But then you start looking at, well, how do you enhance your own privacy? How do you protect yourself online? That comes at a premium cost. If companies aren't going to give it to you for free, which it's not free, it's in exchange for your data, then they're going to charge for it. And most people probably have no idea the amount of money they'd have to pay for what we take for granted as being free services uh, with free email. I think for the first time this morning, I signed up to get a resource. And of course, you know, you have to give your name and your email and all this good. They actually had under the email, free email services are not accepted as a legitimate email address rather than your business, rather than your personal. So it's interesting that companies are going to this. And so I absolutely do believe that it might have started out as a democratizing. It's, it's not going to wind up that way. Now you have to consider, um, Web 3.0, we're in Web 2.0 now. Web 1.0, most current generations would not even recall the, the dial-up beeping and tone that you had to access. 
We're in web 2.0 now where we're the commodity. And web 3.0 is this fabulous uh, utopian idea that we're going to control our data online. That we're going to know exactly where our data is going and we're going to control it and companies will have to come to us for, I don't see that ever happening, I'm sorry. There, there's too much data out there already. I can't see people. It, it would have to come with World War III or something that the entire technology system goes down. I think that's the only way we could actually start from scratch with that. So I'd like to think we're headed that direction and we're going to strengthen that. But people are just now waking up and realizing what a huge issue this is. As uh, Rebecca was saying about the marginalized populations, uh, indigenous rights is one that I am very, very interested in learning more about. The colonization as well, uh, people trying to reclaim their heritage and their heritage includes their data. Um, and then the cultural mores and perspectives that go along with how do you use that data? Uh, because we all know here in the US, we're the wild, wild west. We all know we're giving our data away for free. That's not necessarily true. There are cultures and populations inside the US that don't want to give their data away either. But how do you function in modern society without it? Thank you, Kay. Uh, Rebecca? What a, what a wonderful um, set of comments. I am learning a tremendous amount already. And I, I want to um, approach that the question that you asked, Dara, by, you know, to some extent building on what Kay just said. Um, for Indigenous peoples, the claim to data sovereignty is twofold. It's a claim to control information data that has already been collected about Indigenous peoples from day one. And if you thought back to the Lewis and Clark expedition and things of that nature, they were collecting data along their trip. And libraries and archives are amazing repositories of that data. So I have deep respect for everybody who is on this conference. I admire you so much. And I think that there needs to be even more conversation between those institutions that maintain data. In the United States, there was a notion, a public policy notion that libraries, museums, and archives were gonna serve the interests of democratic society in the United States. Freedom of expression, but we want that information to be accessible to citizens so they understand their history, they understand their rights, they can be full political members of society. That was the promise of American US democracy. Where are we today with that? And so from an indigenous perspective, that data that was collected was then used to create categories that disserved indigenous peoples that put them into a disparities category on every single level. So the level two challenge today is build your own data set. Use your data. What? How many you know, acres of land is subject to agricultural use. What's the quality of soil? How much water do you have? What's the quality of the water? What's your educational um, attainment rate? How could it be improved? All of that requires data, but indigenous peoples are saying, we want to set the standard. And that is the exercise of self-determination. So to me, the antidote for the individualistic promise of democracy, which is now falling short because of the commodification angle. Indigenous peoples, they're saying, we don't wanna be part of that structure. We want a self-determination ethic. We wanna identify the information and we wanna control the use and access to that for our purposes. Thank you. And that leads me Can to I, another, oh, go ahead, please. I just wanted to follow up, Rebecca. Thank you so much for, for, for those remarks. And I think that's important for us to realize too, and we talk about data collection and technology and, and tools of surveillance. You know, we often want to have that liberatory feeling like we're going to get relevant ads or I'm going to get, you know, the the, the best directions to my office. Um, but but these systems are regularly designed and targeted for as systems of control, you know, and they they in, they impact uh, members of society that don't have the ability to to push back, that can't afford it, like you were saying, Kay, but so many of our tools of surveillance and tools of data collection were about control, controlling populations. And now some companies have found some interesting ways to, to build cool products out of them 
Um, but we can't lose sight of, of just that point, Rebecca, that, that, it's, that, that they're too often used as, 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 as systems to try to manage, um, and whether it's through labeling or just, just by collecting that, that data. Um, so we do need to keep that clearly in mind as we, as we think through these problems. Thank you. And the two of you just led me into this question I have long not had a good answer to, but you, you know, I have smart people here who maybe can give me answers to the questions that I can't answer. So which is, how can we, or even can we, as individuals and communities, assert agency over our data and information in the face of all of these structural barriers and incentives in place? And then how could information professionals, the librarians, archivists that sit here, support their users in doing so? You know, just solve the whole problem, y'all. <laughs> yeah. um, well, clearly, you know, and and before I was at Marquette, I I was I first part of my career was teaching at the library program at UW Milwaukee, and so the the focus on issues of of data literacy were certainly quite central. And so, how do we ensure that um, you know you know our, our 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 fellow citizens have the understanding of how technologies work, of what happens when they run a Google search, and the kind of data collection that happens, or location tracking on your phone or, or all these other kinds of things. And, and certainly um, the, the librarians have been at the forefront of providing that kind of training and guidance to, to everyday, uh, everyday citizens. Um, so we could do a lot of work there to help ensure we have that level of data literacy. And, and I know my kids in grade school start learning about, you know, you know, being safe online and, and all these kinds of things. So they can, we could start early with that. The only caution that I throw um, against that is that we can't always make it the end user's responsibility um, and that it's that we, we can't push all that obligation onto users having to protect themselves. Uh, we do need to also have pressure, whether it's through policy or law or whatever it might be on the organizations or governments that are doing the data collection as well. So I do wanna make sure we're, we're, we're thinking about both of those. Um, but I, I do think literacy is one is one way to get us there, but I think we could probably brainstorm a few more. I agree, because I mean, for example, this month is uh, Cybersecurity Awareness Month. At the same time, it's Cyberbullying Awareness Month. And this is an effort to try to educate the younger generations. Well, it's not just those that are cyber bullies, let's be honest, but trying to educate people what it means to be a cyber bully and then to also educate them as to what it means to keep their data safe. When you talk about relying on the experts to give the insight, you have to. If we were to turn this into any other technological conversation, look at doctors. Do we expect people to know everything a doctor is going to do and understand it in order to direct the doctor what they'd prefer to do? No, the doctors would literally kick them out of the office and say, you can go find another doctor. Um, you don't tell the experts what it is to do. That's what we're facing with this, uh, but on a larger, more massive scale is, heck, I don't know it all. Um, I have a feeling Michael and Rebecca would say the same thing. We don't know it all when it comes to technology and uh, what the controls are out there, what companies should be doing, mainly because even within these corporations that are using the data, and by the way, in corporations, I mean also governments, nonprofit entities, we're not talking just private profit-making companies. We don't know what they're doing with the data. We, we have no idea. And they, in some cases, probably don't either. There's a case over in the Netherlands right now that every time a child is born that is registered of a certain religion, um, I think Protestant or Catholic or along those lines, um, they're registered with the church. And every time they move and every time they go somewhere, the church is notified. They're just now waking up. The citizens are and going, wait a minute. Why should the church know everywhere I go and what I do? And it was for good purposes. It was probably for a valid purpose when it started. But now these patterns are so entrenched, people don't even know where the data is going uh, and what people are doing with it. I, it's hard for any privacy officer to even get down to the root of what their current company is doing with the data on a minute fashion. But yet we expect the citizens to know enough to protect themselves. I don't have an answer for that one, Dara. I don't. More education is always wonderful. Uh, companies taking ethical responsibility uh, seems plausible, but 
skeptical, uh, but I think it's going to have to be a multi-prong approach. And unfortunately, we have a long-standing history of not approaching disasters, and I will call it a disaster, disasters like this in a timely manner. We wait until something altogether horrific happens, and then the politicians jump up and we come up with some sort of, you know, cork the plug um, solution that doesn't work in the long term. Thank you. I'll just, and I'll, I'll just jump back in because I think um, this question of data agency um, sometimes gets framed as, as a simple technological solution that platforms might provide. Like, well, we give you control of your data. And that's you know often what Facebook will say. You always have control of your data. You can control who sees what. You can control the visibility. You control your profile. And that ignores everything else that happens off of that screen that they can do with that data and, and where that data might flow. And so it's a little bit of a, only half of the half of the story. Uh, similarly, platforms might give you, um, and there's a movement towards like data portability. Like I should be able to download all of my Facebook data or all of my Twitter data and see what they have about me and then do something else with it. And I don't know if anyone on this webinar has done that. I mean, these are these huge JSON files that are just like, you know, if I showed this to anyone other than my computer science colleagues, they're not going to know what to do with this file, what it means, you know, but they're providing ownership and transparency. And so they can check the box that they've given users agency over their data. But what we're missing is the connection to make it usable for people. So if we really want to give people that kind of agency, we need to think about a broad set of users, a broad set of communities, and what can they actually do with that that kind of um, that kind of data um, agency that's that's provided to them. So I think, um, Dara, how I'd like to approach your question about data agency is in the nature of data governance. Um, so the conversation that we've been having is probably the dominant one about how individuals either consent or don't even know whether they're consenting to some use or storage of their data. And I have no idea in terms of everything that you just said, Kay and Michael, I have no idea what the companies are doing. And part of what they do is probably informed by intellectual property rights to where I couldn't even really secure the knowledge about how their technology works or what is possible for them to do or sell or create. I don't know. So let's just say that the corporations in my mind are like the old trading companies that sort of went all around the world doing whatever they did during the era of colonialism. So nobody regulates them really. And they nobody really knows what they're doing or taking or how it's trading out, really. That's how I would look at that world. So as a lawyer, what do I think about that? Well, I'm kind of scared. And I think the quote unquote government should do something. But when I look at the way that the nation states are set up right now, um, they don't have identical interests and they are still living those histories of exploitation. And so they have different views about how that should happen. On a domestic level, the federally recognized tribal governments in the United States are making the argument that because much of the data that they have to provide is really government controlled data to some extent because of that federal trust responsibility, that there should be a different set of standards. And right now, this is in the form of probably ethical standards, you know, that people are doing to kind of respect tribal sovereignty interests, but not necessarily the same level as legal interests that are already built into statutes that you have to comply with. So tribal governments also, their, their communities are located in zip codes where tribal members order things on Amazon and they get delivered to the zip code and the data about the tribal members is cataloged in all of those ways that consumer data is cataloged. So can we even tease that out and figure out what, and I'm going to use the term here, tribal data, because that is the term that they're building an epistemology of what that might mean into the future. But can we track tribal data? Can, can we control tribal data? 
those are the questions that I'm looking at now. So on a collective basis, how does that play out against the individual consumer basis? But here the argument is the federal government should be exercising its trust responsibility to protect the interests of tribal governments as sovereigns and to have a category of tribal data um, that can be accessible to tribal members, but also exclude non-members from inappropriate use. Is that technologically possible? I don't know, but that is what the hope is. Thank you. Um, so since we're talking about what the technology can and can't do, given how quickly our digital technologies are developing, will we always be playing catch up to protect data sovereignty and privacy? Are technology neutral approaches sufficient? And to go back to the uh, question that was raised earlier, um, None of us, well, okay, very few of us are experts to the level that we're going to be able to sit and ever read a JSON file or, you know, parse through a bunch of XML to figure out what's actually happening. So how do we deal with that constant development of technology and that huge information asymmetry? This is a big problem. Um, there's already some some comments in the chat that I'm responding to about like DuckDuckGo or incognito mode where we're we have lots of products, lots of marketing, lots of trust and faith that these systems are going to provide us privacy or do things, but they're not always foolproof. They're not always 100% um, uh, as secure or as private as we might might think they are. Um, and it's because we sort of get caught into this cycle of what the platforms you know want to put out to show that they're being privacy protecting, but it may not. Of course, there's there's always limits on that. What we may want to engage with as users. So I do think we're always going to be kind of struggling with, you know, as technology advances. We've seen, if you look at the history of just like tracking um, online, once people started blocking cookies and, and creating those kinds of things, you know, the online advertising industry came up with different ways of tracking people it's through browser signatures or pixels or different kinds of uh, uh, beacons that might be, you know, that, that are just different tools that are being used to, to track people. So, they, you know, it's an arms race. In, the, in that kind of sense. And I'm not saying we should throw up our hands and 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 give up, but we're always going to be, you know, sort of tackling that. And I'm sure, you know, you know, those, you know, my my colleagues with with law degrees recognize that the law is, is often a step or two behind keeping up with the technology as well. So that introduces some some new challenges for us. Yeah, uh, agreed. I mean, Dara, you're not asking the easy questions. How do we solve it? I mean, we're all really good at pointing out where the problems are. I'm not sure any of us have the brain trust to be able to fix what they are, because this is the historical story of trying to shut the barn door after the horses have already escaped. Um, again, how do you pull that data back? Because you you could tell companies they can't use the data they've collected up to the point, but there's always going to be those that are going to break the rule. So if the government did take um, a, a strong step and say, hey, you know what? All of our data practices are wrong. We need to stop from scratch. Everyone out there needs to delete all the data they have right now. I don't see that happening. And then the way that our technology works, they'd probably recover most of the data they're, they're, they had anyway within the next six months to a year because it, it's constant. So one of the things that I just saw in the chat with someone was saying GDPR is the strongest uh, data protection laws. No, it's not. So sorry, uh, the strongest data protection law uh, is South Korea. And China is right up there with them. The only reason China doesn't beat South Korea is because of the practices. We're not sure what happens behind the boat, but that's one of the challenges we're also facing. We're not only talking about data governance here, we're not talking about companies here. We're talking globally. This is not a US problem. This is not a North America problem. This is a global problem. I think the only one I haven't seen any issues with um, is probably the South Pole, maybe, Antarctica. Those might be the only ones I haven't seen any issues with yet, but they're probably there. Polar bears are probably complaining. So how do we do it? It's gonna take a lot of people with really, really smart, smart 
knowledge and experience to be able to go in and tackle it on a multi-front. It cannot be a single prong. It can't be just government trying to fix it. It's going to have to take a lot of people putting some effort into it. Now, who are the ones that can kick that off? Is it is it is it us? I'm I'm not an academic. I'd love to be an academic, but I'm not an academic. Um, is it is it the academics? Is it the people that have the time to study it, to work it, to look at some of these ideas that maybe the rest of us are just dealing with in practice and we don't have time to stop and really think about the, the deeper connotations of it, maybe. Is it going to take the multi-billionaires of the world to throw cash at the problem? That would probably help, um, but it has to be multi-pronged. I mean, that that's where it's going to come from. I mean, I don't mean to be such a skeptic, uh, but unfortunately, I work in data privacy, so I am a skeptic. Uh, but it is going to take a lot of people trying to fix it because we're we, we don't even know. You don't even know. People, uh, I think, Michael, you said earlier about people on social media. Um, there are people who refuse to be on Facebook. You know what? They're on Facebook anyway because their friends upload pictures, their families upload pictures. Facebook's already pulling that data from them. Even if you use Google Incognito for your searches, if you have any Google service open at any time that you're on any other website that uses Google Analytics, Google Analytics is going to compare the analytics they're collecting from that other website with your open Google session. So if you have Gmail open or a Chrome browser open, it's going to be able to pull your personal data and connect that in ways you probably have no idea uh, how data would be collected. And so it's going to be a multi-pronged approach. I'd love to be part of the solution. I don't think I have the brain power to be part of the solution. I can just sit here and tell them where they're wrong. And I don't even know of all those areas. Thank you, Kay. That was a great comment. And I recently experienced that they did some upgrade on our university system. And so I was trying to do something on one screen on my Gmail and something on the other, you know, like don't, don't want to mix and, and it pulled it all over into the university, you know, database. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is just horrible because all your individual data is now university. So I I don't I don't think they're doing nearly enough to inform. The people who must use these services what happens to it and therefore our identities are really part of this matrix whether we wanted to or not i have students they're native students they have apps they enter all kinds of information maybe there's some tribal data in there that they don't even know and it gets snapped into this other thing so you're right kate to some extent this is like already in the ether and so the question is how how do you regulate it to avoid harm we have very sophisticated people in the audience i'm not really great at reading chat when i'm listening to i can i can't multitask but i'm trying to look at it and a couple of people have made great comments um, about the software Curtu that does protect tribal data. There are leading people, Jane Anderson, my colleague, um, Stephanie Rainey, Carol at U of A. These are people who are working with the systems, creating things for tribal communities and governments to protect data. Abigail Echohawk is doing phenomenal work in the health space with health data and health organizations and how can even intertribal organizations regulate data um, on behalf of the members who might be going to urban centers to receive care. So there are wonderful people doing the work in discrete areas. The overall picture though, which is what I'm attempting to, to capture for purposes of your questions, Dara, because they are broad. Um, I'm going to end on one note, which is a note that I have that, that, that I think Michael and Kay will know much more than I do about this. But in terms of the data sets that are already in the public domain, there are things about Indigenous peoples that are in the public domain. We're not talking intellectual property rights being able to help in any sense. That data is being put into these artificial intelligence training programs, the algorithms. And because it's so it's so small for indigenous peoples that the, the ultimate effect of that in terms of creating systems that are then trained or attempting to language something that is going to help us determine some outcome, that to me is very problematic. And that idea of data invisibility, which somebody put into the chat, is a huge one because Native people 
well, I don't know, in this country, they're probably 2% of the national population, maybe, you know, in a state like Arizona, it could be 5% of the population. In most states, it's under 1% of the population. They're just invisible in a data context. And yet so much of the architecture of what we are creating, probably for this 3.0 world, Kate, I, I don't know, that's a new one for me to think about, but the architecture is going to depend on these machine translations of things where the data is insufficient. So that is my concern. Maybe I'm misguided, um, but, but I would really love to hear what people think about that at some point in our conversation today. Oh, I'm going to jump on it right now because this this is one of the bandwagons I, I love to dive into, Dara Shush. Um, it's the data that people are using to train these systems. People say bad data, bad results. Uh, the, if the data is junk, the results are going to be junk. The data is not junk. The data is real. Unfortunately, the data sets are built from populations or from data on populations that are cultural history has misrepresented unethically. So perfect example, the small percentage of Native Americans in the, in the nation, um, yet their data is what is readily accessible. So it's used in a lot of the AI and a lot of the machine learning. If you look, here's a, a good example on prisons. So AI has learned that African-American men between 25 and 32 are most likely to be shoplifters. Therefore, if you're in a retail environment, you should watch any African-American man between 25 and 32 so you can catch your shoplifters. Okay, no. Those just happened to be the ones that were convicted because they couldn't afford wonderful public defenders. They couldn't afford high priced attorneys. They're the ones that maybe the police have gone after historically because of racial problems. So it's not that the data is bad, it's the practices in our country that built the data that is bad. So by training the AI using this good data, bad practices, you're, you're perpetuating. Uh, the fallacy, and we're starting to see it. So any company that uses AI and machine learning that is not just welcoming diverse and inclusive opinions in developing the software, they need to celebrate it. They need to go out and find those diverse uh, opinions and persons to come in to help develop it, but to test it and to always challenge the results and what they come out. Because we've seen some horror stories uh, from AI. We, we've seen it already, but you're absolutely right, Rebecca. It's this data that they have available to be able to innovate with new technology, but yet it's based on something that we would never want to perpetuate if we thought about it out loud. You know? And, and it's, a, and a a further challenge we see is that sometimes when people are making good efforts to try to correct for the small data sets, um, to go find more data. Like for example, if someone's trying to train an algorithm to uh, identify someone's gender based on an image, and they've realized that that algorithm doesn't work very well for people who are transitioning gender. So what do we do? We need to go get more examples of people transitioning gender into our, into our training set but now we're suddenly putting that population under additional surveillance and we're gathering more data from those vulnerable, uh, a population who may be already vulnerable in order to make our algorithms better. And so we see this in other cases as well, where we're suddenly in order to get better data to compensate for some of these gaps in the data, uh, we might actually be actually causing a secondary problem uh, by now you know, new harms through new forms of data collection. So we get caught in this, in this cycle now of, of, of impacts on, on particular communities. That is something that we definitely need to make sure uh, we're paying attention to when we design and, and build these kinds of systems. So we got about 12 minutes left here. And I think this is probably the question we're all uh, wondering. Um, Bren asked earlier, does, is privacy even a thing? Is it all doom and gloom? Or are there any things out there that give us hope about privacy and data sovereignty? So I, I have this all the time with my with my students in my classroom. It happened even this week where we end the whole session and we, you know, we just say burn it all down. Like it's just, you know, it, you know, and and I, I work really hard to try to find some positive, you know, routes and, and positive ways to to deal with things. I mean, I think privacy still is a thing. Um, you know, many of us, younger generations, older generations, we all engage 
in digital platforms in different ways, but we all still have privacy. You know, people are, are sharing perhaps more information, but they're not sharing everything. You know, we, we all have relationships. We have social values of privacy, community values of privacy. Um, but it is a, a, an interesting challenge for us on, on how do we build our trade-offs and how do we how do we sort of navigate some of the the new the new ways that data is being leveraged and, and collected from us. So I do see hopefulness in the fact that you know paradigms like privacy by design have become more common um, or ethical design as, as 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 the way that I would talk about it in, in, in my classes. Uh, the fact that I'm working in a computer science department and I'm an ethicist, you know, I'm not a computer scientist and we're trying to train our future computer and data scientists to have some awareness of the kinds of issues that we've been talking about today, I think is a good direction that, that we're seeing at least in how we're training uh, the newer generations of, of professionals. Um, so I, 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 I try to be hopeful. I'm not so sure if our current companies and the people running those companies are gonna be the ones to sort of move us in that direction. But but I do feel that we 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 do have reasons to be hopeful. But yeah, you know, I might I might be in the minority on that. So I, uh, we'll we'll hear what what everyone else here thinks. No, I am internally optimistic. Uh, believe it or not, very very optimistic. Um, I run a podcast, serious privacy podcast that I share with a co-host in Europe. He's a former regulator. Uh, before GDPR was a thing. So we have vastly different opinions and we were just analyzing the new executive order for signals intelligence that came out October 7th with all the other proclamations as well. Same thing, eternally optimistic that we're headed in the right direction. Uh, you don't know a crime is gonna be committed usually unless you have a history of what a crime is. That's, how, that's why I say the bad guys are always ahead of the good guys because we're always running behind them. So we don't know something's gonna go wrong until we actually see it happen and we get experience. So we're in that stage now where we're all recognizing where the problems could be. Now we probably can't see everything because we don't know what all the companies are doing, but we, we, we're not omniscient, you know? We, we can see what the problem is. We're starting to realize that the more people are starting to learn, they're starting to hear about data, um, literacy, the more that indigenous populations and marginalized populations are able to raise their heads long enough to look and see what's happening. Because be honest, a lot of people can't. They only go day to day. They're not thinking about these other issues that are not impacting them right now. They can't. Um, I've been in that position. I know what it's like. Um, you have to, it's a luxury to be able to think about these issues in most cases. Um, but now that we're starting to see that data literacy, we're starting to bring visibility to it. Oh, absolutely, there's hope. I'm a strong believer in innovation, uh, but I'm also a strong believer in human nature at some point is going to trump technological innovation to the point that we're using technology innovation for good. Um, it's going to take a lot of work, though. But yeah, there's always hope. Always, always. I love that I am in the company of two optimists. Yay. So I, too, am an optimist. Um, despite the significant concerns that we have raised um, today, I think there are two things that I find very exciting about this time. Number one is that we can actually also utilize the technology to reveal inequities and therefore control for a political form of discourse that wants to continually negate the existence of inequities to justify some current or past practice. And so I think well that- Well said, Rebecca, I'm sorry. I'm gonna jump in on very well said. Thank you. So so I, I love that about these conversations and about the data even that is being used to train the AIs as being fundamentally important to reveal, to see, to talk about, and to have that collective conversation with and among all of the groups whose interests are implicated so that that idea of vulnerability doesn't become something that you are beneficent in kind of creating some standard that will accommodate them. No, it becomes a baseline for a practice in your society that achieves data justice or something of that nature. So yeah, we have a ways to go on that, but I, I think that we're in the conversation now. And the second thing, and this is probably most prominently featured in Article 31, of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples that talks about their right to cultural heritage. And we've traditionally thought of cultural heritage as material artifacts of culture. 
but that article basically says it's the material is the tangible and it's the intangible knowledge that surrounds that and it's not just parceled out into intellectual property rights if you can commodify that knowledge no it's the knowledge that is associated with all of what is indigenous culture and that to me is the power because indigenous people still often have their language, their epistemologies, they have the most ancient, intact knowledge systems in the world. And so when you talk about the structure of knowledge and the ways in which we restructure knowledge, they have the most capacity to reveal a new form of using technology to continue ancient cultures, but in a way that allows the survival of people over time, which has always been the, the ethic of resilience that guides Indigenous societies. There was a, a recent case study I read about where um, to a Native Hawaiian and a Maori um, individual have this company where they're training AIs to speak Maori. They are inputting all of these sources of Maori language that are both in archives, but also in living Maori cultures and then extending it into the South Pacific with other island groups who have some form of the language stock. It is fascinating. It is the repository of ethical knowledge as well as the knowledge of survival throughout time. So it was very powerful and I really commended those young men for taking the initiative to create something like that. Oh, that's fascinating. I love it. Dara and I can relate to that, given how long it took for AI and phone systems to even recognize the Southern accent. It took a long time. So that is a huge effort. That is fascinating. Uh, I'm just, I'm so delighted to have you all today. And, the, you know, we're dealing with huge problems here, but it's it's not all doom and gloom. It's not hope. So we have just a couple minutes left here. And I did see Indra's questions. I don't think we have time to answer those in depth. So um, feel free to, I put my email in the chat and I will also share the questions with the panelists afterwards. Uh, so I will just say, since we have just a couple minutes left, since we're talking to librarians today, if you could tell, you know, every librarian, you know, someone in a tiny little library, you know, my library here in a town of 2000 in Canada, dealing with, you know, uh, patrons who are mostly, you know, older coal miners who want to just be able to go on the computer and talk to their grandkids and are facing this question of how could I do that without being, you know, exploited? What's the one thing you would tell every librarian in the audience here today? Uh, that I wish it were that easy. <laughs> that there was just <laughs> that there was just one thing. The one thing. Um, yeah. um, I do think there's some. Many of you are probably familiar with with some good resources out there on how to protect oneself online. Uh, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, EFF.org, usually has some pretty good and usable tools and resources to help guide people about how to set up their settings on their phone or cookie settings on their browser. So you know, there's a, there are some user friendly kind of tactics that people can take to try to uh, protect themselves. And I think that's something that that most libraries could help their patrons, you know, walk walk through and work through some of those. Thank you, Michael. Uh, do what you're doing, become knowledgeable yourselves, learn what it is. Uh, when someone asked me what, what conference I was speaking at and I said it was Library 2.0, they're like, what would librarians need to know about privacy for? So um, learn. Keep learning, uh, get involved in the conversation. Y'all are the, the gatekeepers to a lot of uh, not only knowledge, but the ways of getting to knowledge, I think is probably the most valuable. Uh, so I would do that. And then I would say, uh, echoing Michael about teaching users how to protect themselves, multi-factor authentication is the number one way people can prevent uh, their data what they control, their accounts being hacked or, or accessed by others. There's a lot of scams going on nowadays. So if that's the, the only thing you can do is help teach them about multi-factor authentication, uh, that it's important, that's probably one of the big, and by the way, do it for yourselves too. I know it's inconvenient every time you wanna access something, you have to check the code on your phone, but it really is the number one way uh, to protect your own data through your own accounts. 
So from my perspective, I'm interested in global governance systems right now, because both on the, on the level of kind of climate change and sustainability, which is the other massive area that I work on. And in this area, I can see that there are these pivotal gaps. So the governments are doing things. So if we thought about information technologies and governments, well, they have national security interests and they have to protect to some extent citizen privacy interests under the constitution or whatever the heck they have to do. But governments have this very instrumental way of looking at their obligations. And it's oftentimes not until some huge revealing congressional testimony that's totally embarrassing and awful comes out and then people are like, uh, well, I guess we should have a law or something to, to deal with that. Um, so that's the, that's why the law is always way, way, way behind. On the other hand, the companies are way forward, right? Because they get rewarded monetarily anytime they innovate in a way that, that kind of deepens the, the economic pool that they're mining. So, and that's what they do. And they do it well and, and bless them, you know, right to have successful companies. But who is serving the gap there? Because the consumer just, it's baffling world for them. And they're so easily exploited. Consumers are just, they want to do the right thing, but they, they don't know. So libraries, archives, those, in, those are powerful knowledge institutions. This is a place where the gaps can be addressed in a way that is responsible and, and totally goes to the call that you mentioned, Dara, in terms of that idea of democratizing institutions to serve the interests of our contemporary society. So I think there's a pivotal role there. I am so excited that we have the level of knowledge and expertise in the audience and that you put together this amazing panel and that the program um, is, is thriving there um, at San Jose State. So I just want to commend you for being so thoughtful, conscientious, and that is the role that I see libraries and archives having. Thank you all so much. This was delightful. This was amazing. And I'm just so honored and pleased that y'all were able to join us. Can we have a little round of applause for our wonderful panelists? And now we have five minutes to get to our breakout sessions, which are going to be very exciting and deal with some of those issues of things like AI that we were talking about today. Thank you, Dara. Thank you, panelists. Thank you. Thank you all. Have a wonderful conference. It was great. Thanks, everyone. Bye, y'all. <laughs>